one of the things that I've been interested more and more um, in recent time really is not so much entirely what's involved necessarily with MySQL today, but I've actually become a lot more interested in what is essentially the state of the open source databases. Um, because the state of the ecosystem, which is the open source databases, has actually been growing a lot in the last few years. Um, and as it's been growing, I've actually continued to find this, uh, you know, we've matured beyond just essentially two open source databases, maybe a third, maybe a fourth, and you keep gaining. It's been interesting to watch that the environment for open source databases has become nearly as rich. They're not quite as rich yet as the commercial database market. So, one thing about where is the open source databases today? Well, the answer is actually the open source database world today is ubiquity. Um, we are, um, you name it, everywhere. You picked up Skype, what do you got? Postgres. You've seen a Google AdWord, you've seen MySQL. You went and searched on Craigslist, you've seen Sphinx. If you have, you know, pretty much touched anything, there is no point today where you do not encounter an open source database in your life. If you don't think you do, then probably pick up your phone and it's probably got SQLite on it. So just to know that the state of the open source database is that, that we're actually everywhere. So what's really going on and really interesting right now in the world of the open source database? Because essentially, you know, the hardware market really hasn't changed what we've been doing with open source databases. But suddenly, in very recent time, things have actually started to change. One thing we saw, when we went from, you know, one processor to two processor, that wasn't really all that interesting. That meant that your operating system essentially ran on one processor, and on your other processor went your application. And there wasn't much on, I mean, as early as things like as 1999, we did see quad, you know, quad boxes. But those early quad boxes, well, they didn't really perform very well, and it wasn't really a fault in the database at that point. But multi-core uh, architecture has grown. It's grown really, really fast. You know, the, the number of cores that we're seeing doubling over time, uh, this is actually upping the game, because where open source databases could pretty much live on the concept we have one processor, you know, we don't really have to think much about threading. Uh, that's no longer the case. Even early open source databases like MySQL, which were threaded in the very beginning. Well, guess what? The issue was, yeah, they were threaded in the very beginning, but it doesn't mean they were actually threaded very well. And as we've seen multi-core show up, that multi-threadedness or that need for multi-threadedness has increased. Something to think out. A lot of times I ask myself, really, what is, you know, where are we really thinking about? Where are we going with data? Well. You know, just to think about this, as far as relational databases go, and just data in general, you know, the Library of Congress today is about 26 terabytes of data. You know, that's, you know, this records, a, you know, some piece of human knowledge there. And that's in 26 terabytes of data. That's something that is not all that unaffordable um, from any startup in health. It's actually somewhat affordable by anybody who's sitting around the house, you know, grabbing BitTorrent files. But despite this 26 terabytes of data, the truth is, though, that we're generating lots and lots and lots of data every single day. Every day, we're recording everything. Literally. You know, you know that Google struck for recording traffic. Every time you ping a website, there's a blog that's left behind. There's all this data being generated. And a lot of this data is being generated in open source databases. And we haven't probably quite figured it all out just yet. You know, one of the other big changes really is solid state disks. And I hear people poo-poo on this because they're like, oh, well, you know, they've, they've got failure points at this point and they're not big enough. But you start rating these things together. It wasn't too long ago that a solid state disk, you know, I'm sorry, that an actual hard drive was the same size as the solid state disk. And the trick is that the solid state disks are actually doubling much faster uh, than what we actually saw, you know, a nice little spinny disk go. They're rapidly increasing really, really quickly. And the basic paradigms that we built around on the concept how we write a database is changing. You know, we always have been, you know, after the phone up, we can't handle random I.O. We must figure out. And we've written all this code to, to basically, you know, solve the problem of how do we handle random I.O. How do we make sure it's not randomized? And the thing is, is that that's all going away. There's a lot of code right now that's been written for an optimization that's actually no longer needed. And the thing is, is that, you know, you're sitting there saying, well, you know, will my database fit? One thing I've learned about is that most, most of what's going on out there in the world, most of these, you know, most databases out there are actually not even this big. They're not even as big as 32 gigabytes. There's an awful lot of sites out there today that run in just a few gigabytes, and that's all they actually run into. All of this stuff actually fits on solid state disk. 
And this, in turn, makes it, are going to make us have to rethink about how we're developing open source databases. You know, what are we actually doing? We now suddenly have this, all these multi-core systems sitting around, and suddenly we have solid, you know, solid state disks, which means that the gain just increased. You know, all of us who have been improving all along for what has been current hardware, you know, suddenly the, you know, the traditional database environment is changing. And we're going to have to actually sit back and actually think about what we've been designing and how fast we can change as well. Um, another thing that actually concerns me a lot is the fact that, you know, this was a number I heard from a TED video, is that 6% of the world's power goes to data centers. And in these environments, you know, I go into someone's environment and they say we've got, you know, 1,000 or 10,000 MySQL servers sitting around. And that's a whole lot of freaking electricity we're chewing up. And the thing is, is that this is something we can actually think about a little bit as open source developers. Every time we improve on conformance, it's not only a question of performance as far as how many transactions per second or whatever else. There are things we can decode in that would actually make us use less electricity. You know, how many times we call sync, how we actually write the databases. You know, we can actually affect that 6% power usage. You know, and that's something we ought to be thinking about because, well, this is something we can actually make a radical uh, change in our environment about. You know, so where are we even at in this stuff? So let's see, you know, where's Postgres nowadays? Postgres today has six replication solutions. So what does that mean? Does that mean there's some kind of, you know, uh-oh, what do we have to figure out? What it means, though, is that there's a diversity of uses today for Postgres. That means that there wasn't just one replication pattern. There were actually multiple replication patterns they're attacking. Their problem domain and the solutions that they're going after is increasing. You know, this was we get into. As databases are used in more environments, we're going to see more choices. So when I look at six replication solutions, what I see is a growth actually in Postgres. It has active Windows support. You know, they are the first open source database that really actually started getting multi-core stuff right. Um, they were ahead of all the rest of us as far as getting performance actually in the database. You know, and these three things like recursive stored fun function support. So you see continuation in the product, in sorry, in the, the project for its things which are really kind of its own bread and butter, which is what Postgres is about. Postgres is about store procedures, it's about writing a good SQL standard database that's ACID compliant. And all of this you can continue kind of seeing how they improve upon things. You know, we look inside the MySQL ecosystem, you know, we've started seeing, for instance, multi-core fixes finally show up. So, you know, as of 5.4, there's uh, multi-core. And in the, My in the MySQL ecosystem, we see something entirely different. For instance, what, what I work on, Drizzle, which is a new micro -print. And at the same time, there are many forks that are occurring. And it's interesting to watch that some of the forks are ideological forks, very close to the original. They're either based on some little point wavering back and forth, but some of the forks are also much more radical. If you would walk around downstairs and you look, for instance, at something like, for instance, a kick fire, that is actually a fork. It's a radical concept of how to put that inside of a piece of hardware. It may actually be the same thing, but it is actually a fork. You look at where info right, you look at all of these different radical changes. So we're actually seeing this explosion right now of forks. And it's not just about the fact that an acquisition occurred. What it's really about is that the ecosystem is actually growing and the needs of the ecosystem are actually growing. So whenever people ask me about are there many forks, I actually get kind of excited about it because I see people trying new ideas and trying to experiment with new pieces. And this is something that my school's pretty much done from the beginning, is tries to tackle different kind of ideas. Um, other things that I think is really interesting right now, you know, a few years ago, someone came to me and said, there's no way there's ever going to be a column-oriented, you know, design for an open source database. That just won't happen. There won't be enough engineering to do it. But, you know, when we start looking around right now, if there's anything but, we see InfoBright um, that went from trying to create a proprietary database to then going into an open source, more, more of a more open source model. And why do we see database vendors right now going towards more open source models? I think the answer is pretty simple. It's called channel. The open source world is the only way that you can actually get a new product out there and get people actually interested in it. We see things like LucidDB. This is a database I didn't really know much about this week until I finally could sit down with one of the architects. And I found it fascinating. So what this thing is doing um, is pretty much what I've been always trying to do. Um, and namely that is it's actually a microkernel design. Um, it's a half Java, uh, half C++ um, database where, for instance, you know, their optimizer is actually pluggable. They can place in new rule sets within the optimizer in Java code. Um, that's pretty fascinating. I've never actually seen anybody do anything like this. 
Um, so I find this pretty interesting. In fact, that what they do is they have a base set of core pieces, and then, for instance, LucidDB is actually an example or an expression of those core pieces. And I believe the one uh, database that was down in the uh, uh, down in the uh, Expo Center, which is the Stream database, is actually built off built off this as well. So the idea is building a core and building other databases around it. And this Java, you know, C++ framework, I kind of find this pretty actually fascinating. So it's pretty neat to see. And I got to say, of the probably the databases I've seen in the last week that I'm likely to go back and take more look at, it's probably one because it sounds like it's got some good ideas. Um, the other thing to think about also is the object like the database world. You know, it's not just that you know we're dealing with the standard SQL relational model anymore. You know, Google actually kind of blew the doors off that when it actually taught, released its big table paper. Because as soon as it released its big table paper, what? Suddenly there was these people talking about how do we deal with big table, and folks who were said, oh, we've already built that, and we've seen open source solutions like mobile. But on the same token, you know, this also created a world for people to start thinking about things differently and not necessarily being caught in the SQL paradigm. Hypertable is a great example of this. So Hypertable, excuse me, is a big table implementation. It's used by Baidu. And it's kind of fascinating. What they're trying to do is build what is essentially a big table like database system. And getting, and if you think about it, Baidu incorporating that, well, that's kind of impressive. That actually shows some stuff about scaling. So Hypertable is one of the ones I found most interesting in recent time. The other one I think is really amazing is actually CouchDB. So think about this. We all have, you know, when you're sitting there and you're writing your web application, um, what are you really thinking about most of the time? You're thinking about documents. In this case, uh, Damien actually took and created a database based on a document, the concept of a document, such that you store documents and these documents can have new fields, they can grow. And the most interesting thing I thought he did with it is he created a REST interface onto it. So unlike all the other databases where we always create proprietary, you know, here's our proprietary protocol and how we try to ship stuff across the wire, he actually did something the opposite, something that frankly the rest of us have always been too scared to do is he created a REST interface. His transport mechanism is HTTP. And what's really, really awesome about this is he actually picks something like JSON. The object information that's passed and forth is JSON, which means that, for instance, you can have web applications that directly um, through, you know, communicate back through the REST interface and grab objects for this. And so that means, yes, that all the JavaScript developers can sit and talk to the database and that you can actually have object store out there. Um, that's a pretty powerful sort of concept because it really sort of makes and empowers the front-end uh, interface developers. Uh, someone showed me uh, an example uh, this week of where you could actually do a MapReduce operation by taking, the, it's a web form, and you could actually put some JSON code into the web form, and it would actually execute against your uh, CouchDB. That's crazy. That's amazing also at the same time. And that, that shows some actual difference in some ingenuity. You know, groups like, for instance, the BBC have actually picked up CouchDB. And if probably all of the open source databases out there that I see, like, growing in production use rapidly, this is probably the one that actually is growing the most rapid. Um, it's a really neat design. And in part, I believe that because it takes what is really a paradigm, which is not SQL, but something much closer to the way that web developers think. Is it going to be perfect for all solutions? No, it's not going to be perfect for all solutions. But mixing in these sorts of databases into your environment, that's awesome. So to me, CouchDB is actually uh, one of the things that I've been most, uh, I, I stayed the most interested in watching. And like obviously, not all this stuff is relational. Notice, Hypertable is not relational. CouchDB is not relational. Um, and it's just not. We have Sphinx, for instance. That's an inverted index, full text indexes. This is something that Craigslist use. You know, you basically have what is a complete server um, to handle full text indexing. And face it, most of the time when people are searching, they're not really actually searching off relational pieces. They're thinking, how do people search today? They think like Google, that full text thing. That's what they think about. And so I find Sphinx pretty amazing for that. And we even have things that are even completely not uh, relational even when we think about databases. Hadoop with HBase underneath it. I don't think it's too stretched to actually call it a database. Um, and I'm finding that kind of a neat thought. Um, because if you think about it, suddenly you have something that is completely not wrappable, but people are storing data in it, and they are getting que actually queries against it. I have my issues with it, but I still actually think it's kind of neat to see this whole expansion. And if you go back like five or six years, we didn't see this. We didn't see all these different attempts to create different databases. For the most part, 
people will show up, show up with a brand new SQL parser and a new piece of this and say, look, I've created another database. And you kind of look at it and go, wow, could you have used any of the ones written so far? Um, and I, so I find it actually neat that a lot of this stuff is actually picking up. Um, you know, and then it also brings the whole question of MapReduce. Um, this is the one area that actually I get kind of nervous about a little bit about relational databases um, versus MapReduce. Um, a lot of the MapReduce stuff we see today, I don't really think it's learned very well from like what, what we learn from databases. It's not indexed. It's a throw a program at something and run it across a whole lot of nodes. Um, this is part of what I was talking about earlier. How is we, people who write open source databases, start to think about the whole environmental impact. If you say you can use crappier amounts of code, it'll cost you 10 times the machines. Well, let's face it, a lot of companies will buy 10 times the machines if they think it'll actually work. If they say this will lower their delivery times, they'll do this. But in return, ask yourself, you know, if you can keep things squeezed to less computers, you're going to use less electricity. Um, and databases use an awful lot of power on this planet. So I'm kind of hoping that the MapReduce world can actually learn something from the database world. Because um, I think we actually do it a little bit environmentally. Um, and you know, it's not like we can't actually reverse this databases. Stonebreaker had a great paper recently um, all about actually doing MapReduce in the database. And I find it funny because we've been doing the same thing. So for instance, this is an example of uh, a user-defined function we wrote. That what we do is we update URL set content from Beerman, the URL get. And that's what we've done. So in this case, this is in the case where we've actually went out and mapped out you know, a set of functions and actually started retrieving data back in. And it's not entirely what you think that absolute MapReduce is. But this is a use of that same similar technology. Um, so there are actually ways we can integrate this with the world of open source databases. So the question, I think, at the end of all of this is some people ask me, well, so what am I going to do? Can I actually make money off open source databases? And so I think there's a billion dollar question. So MySQL, believe it or not, whatever, got paid. You know, There's a billion dollar acquisition that occurred to actually acquire it. So this means that the world is actually seeing that there's a lot of value in open source databases. And I think what we'll see is that there are actually the business for, you know, for the open source databases is going to be a very large multi-billion dollar business. Is it all going to be based on acquisitions? No. But if you look at the growth of companies like Greenplum and others, it's really obvious that open source databases or even the use of open source technology to build databases is actually a really large business. Um, so there is a billion dollar question out there, which is, what is who is actually next? Because there is someone out there that is going to create the next set of technologies, which is um, actually going to fetch that kind of money. But it's not like we're all sitting around and doing this and thinking we're all, you know, not going to get paid. The reality is, is that this is actually a big business. So that is my thoughts on the state of the open source databases. Thank you all very much.